Hello everyone, and welcome back to Dirty Twenties D and D. My name is Kiernan. What was that? Whoa. Okay. That's not right. <clears throat> oh, come on. I really like those. It's fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Oh, come on. <sighs> okay. I can get used to this. Hello everyone and welcome back to How To Homebrew, the series where I reveal all of my DM secrets so that you can enhance your games through my experience. My name is Kieran and I'm the DM here at the Dirty Twenties. In this series we've done monsters, quests, and campaign settings. I think it's finally time we tackle merging these ideas together. After all, it's in the name of the game. It's about time we tackle dungeons. When planning a dungeon or a dungeon-like area, you must first consider where it's going to be placed, as that's going to guide a lot of your decisions later on. You could need a dungeon in a densely packed forest, in which case it could be a dryad's intricately designed nest, or a long lost temple. It could be underwater, in which case it could be a Sahagan palace, or a long lost temple. It could be inside of a volcano, in which case it could be a series of tunnels created by burrowing magma creatures, or it could even be a long lost temple. All of these are valid, and I'm just picking randomly from those. I think I'm gonna make a long lost temple, and I think I'm gonna set it in an underwater seaweed forest growing over a dormant volcano on the seafloor. Jokes aside though, say that you do want to make that. The atmosphere writes itself. It should be cold at first, but grow warmer as they venture inwards and downwards. It might not conjure a lot of smells, but eventually sulfur could perhaps creep into and overpower their nostrils as they grow closer and closer to the center of this ashen place. Sounds will be muffled, hard to recognize, but essential to follow as their visions are obscured by the murky depths and plumes of smoke and steam, giving them actually like the mechanical effect of being heavily obscured. Also, perhaps eventually, they could come to a chamber filled with air. Just a random idea, but random ideas like that for, they make for iconic ideas later on. Iconic moments for your players to reminisce about later. When they're fleshed out and described with the same love and attention that you hold for them, I'm sure that your players will share that love. Okay, so now we have our idea. It's time to plan how it's going to be done within. First, how long do you want this dungeon to be? Is it a small one lasting only one or two games? A larger one that bookends a big quest, a grand game that takes five or six entire sessions to run through? Or should the dungeon be the game itself, like Mad Mage, and take 20 to 40 sessions to fully run through? This will determine how your dungeon is formatted. A shorter one will have a lot more focus on puzzles, traps, and mazes, while a longer one can incorporate more combats and harder challenges for your players. So, the three layouts I'm showing you right now are common examples of dungeons, but this middle one is what we're going to use for our dungeon today. A nice middle ground behind, you know, between incredibly simple and insanely detailed and intricate. This one will last for about three games. For a lower level group, um, it will have four combats, four puzzles, and somewhere around seven traps. That's sort of the numbers you should be sk um, skating around. Obviously, you can have more or less of the different ones, but if you want a game to uh, a dungeon to only last a certain number of games, combats are usually where you want to limit yourself. For instance, um, your average combat's going to probably take about an hour. If it's just like five people against a mimic, it's going to take 30 minutes or less. But if it's you know six skeletons against a party of five, it's going to take you know. About an hour and you know your final combat's gonna last about two at least so that's sort of how you have to be thinking about these things if you're if you want your game to only last you know three hours each session 
you know, really got to start considering how long your combats are. So, the first combat or two should be more of a nuisance or a way to tire or weaken the characters before the final challenge. Stuff like mimics, doppelgangers, and skeletons, things to act as interesting fodder. For an underwater dungeon like this, I'm going to modify the skeleton stat block to bring in some things from the Sahagin um, and have them populate a room that they have to go through and then maybe also a side room over here that's locked and they can go in there if they want to get some extra loot as a reward for exploring. But it's important that you make it clear that the main goal of the dungeon is down one path and that this is a side path unless you want your dungeon to act as a maze. If you don't, if you want it to be a very clear, um, straightforward, we're going through here, this should be the obvious way, you should look and see, that's probably a side corridor that takes you to some bedrooms, probably will have some loot, but won't be exactly where you're looking, then make it clear to them that that's what you're actually going for. Uh, I could also incorporate sentient statues or golems to populate other portions, being an, an underwater dungeon. You know, statues covered in moss and seaweed are um, good environmental things as well. So, like here, maybe I could put one stone golem that guards um, some passageway, perhaps. And then, in the final chamber for our, our last combat, uh, we could perhaps put our big boss, and it could be something like an... An abolith, a strong foe for sure, but one that could be outsmarted instead of purely beaten in combat, if that's the kind of story you want to tell. So, next with puzzles. They should be along the lines of riddles, simple interlocking pattern matching, or fake buttons that cause a series of lights and sounds to flash and reset whenever the button presses, but never actually mean any harm. Psychological, instead of purely physical. I'm going to start the dungeon with actually one of those right here, and then have a ring puzzle there where they could match a pattern on the wall, and then maybe we could also have a riddle here, and then over here right before the final chamber maybe you can do a, a magic puzzle where you have to cast three different spells of different schools to gain entry to the room. Cantrips are allowed because what if they already used all their spell slots? They have to get in somehow. And then lastly for traps, they should be along the lines of pit traps, arrow slits, trip wires in the sword, thrown around like, uh, like so. So, um, what's very important is that you check yourself and make sure that it never gets boring. Like here it's, it's combat, trap, puzzle, combat. That's a good order. Uh, three puzzles, combats, or trap in a row is never fun. You never be like, okay, roll initiative, and roll initiative again, and again, and there's the whole game. It was just stupid pointless combats and we didn't even make it to the end. Or, all we did was solve your dumb riddles for three hours and then we left. That's not fun. So, over here we also have a trap, puzzle, combat, trap, loot. But that's fine because it's optional and you made sure they knew it was optional. The general scheme shouldn't have too many double ups. If you want a longer dungeon, extend these orders out, add social encounters like trapped friendlies or buried cities. You can think of adding wandering outsiders, or knowledgeable remnants from older expeditions like ghosts that haunt the place, or journals of adventurers past. The main threat at the end can be guarding anything from a lost treasure like a magical item or a royal heirloom to just a chest full of gold and jewels. The monsters and enemies within can be there because they're vengeful spirits of failed adventurers past, or because they were paid for or enslaved by the boss at the end. All of these ideas should be incorporated with ideas that we've gone over before. Uh, Homebrewing Monster should get you a good idea for sort of the cannon fodder that you could throw in their way. The uh, campaign settings could help you think of big bads and ideas like that. Um, <clears throat> sort of ideas like this. Quests, obviously, how to homebrew quests will help you with the ideas behind why they've gone into the dungeon and what story the dungeon could unfold. These are sort of the general schemes. There's also other things to consider in dungeons, such as lighting, temperature, sounds, things that we've I mentioned earlier, but things that actually will make a dungeon feel unique. Say only half your group has dark vision. You've been giving them the benefit of the doubt so far, but now they're underwater, they have no torches, it's dark, what is happening? And that 
And that is how I homebrew dungeons. Thank you very much for joining me. I've really enjoyed sharing my thoughts on homebrewing content for this game that we all love, but that is the end for this season of How To Homebrew. I may be back with another, but for now, I've run out of ideas for videos for this series, and I'm going to be entirely honest about that. This is far from the end of my weekly videos, though. Next week, I'm going to go over 10 powerful character builds for this game at various levels, and how I feel about power gaming. Spoiler alert, I don't inherently think it's a bad thing. But with all of that said, thank you for joining me. I hope you all had a good day. Please leave comments below um, about potential ideas for future seasons of How To Homebrew. Make sure that you like the video and subscribe to the channel. We will be posting lots more content in the coming days. But with all of that said, 